So my video definitely spawned a huge debate on whether anti-doping should exist. I don't think people realize just how complex this discussion can get. Like five years ago, the debate was simplistic and most arguments made by both sides were pretty bad. After I posted my video though, I read a lot of good arguments, something i would never really seen before. So in this video, I'm mainly just gonna go over the video made by Seb from Whale Thing House. I'll also go over arguments I found online that differ from his. But before I get into the video, I'd just like to address the most common criticism on my video. A lot of people were mentioning how I described America as a mostly drug-free country. It was kind of my fault because I didn't say that I was only talking about Olympic lifting. This kind of reminded me of um, Zach's video. So check out his video because I mostly agree with him. So I won't waste any more time. I'll just get straight into Seb's video. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the four main points that Clarence puts forward that fit essentially under this umbrella that anti-doping is unethical. And I'm gonna talk about them and I'm gonna show where we delineate logically. These four points are, one, that it creates an unlevel playing field. Two, it facilitates corruption. Three, it demonizes PEDs. And four, it forces athletes to use dangerous compounds. One, it creates an unlevel playing field. I don't feel like Clarence is putting forward a truly convincing argument that the playing field would be level in a non-tested federation. It's almost this utopian idea that with no restraints, everything will suddenly become fair. But it seems to me that in the situations where drugs in sports are legal, then the countries that invest the most in developing better PEDs will have a significant advantage and that the playing field will only become more unlevel. The problem with this argument is that it's describing the current reality. Like, what's stopping countries from investing in better PEDs right now? It has happened in the past as well. The example being the Balco scandal, which happened with anti-doping in place. Like, systematic doping is state-funded. The countries that invest the most into it are going to benefit the most. East Germany and Russia invested a lot into their doping program, and other countries are most likely investing in their doping programs right now to create new and more powerful PEDs. Drugs being banned from sports doesn't stop this. There would also be a massive incentive for a country to synthesize a designer steroid or a new PED because it would be completely unknown by WADA, so they won't even be able to test for it. This would give the country a huge advantage, perhaps a bigger advantage compared to if anti-doping didn't exist. Also, Balco was completely unregulated. There were no clinical trials and absolutely no safety testing. So in the drug development process, there's a lot of regulations in place to improve safety. Like you probably heard a lot about that in the news recently. So if PEDs were legal, they would also be subject to the same regulations, at least in an ideal world. I think Seb could have made a better argument here. I think a better question to ask is, the countries that invest the most money into doping will have an advantage. What would be a more fair situation? A world with anti-doping or a world without anti-doping? So we'll define fair as meeting a more level playing field. And keep in mind, this question is not asking about what causes more overall harm. I'll address that later. I think it's best to answer a single question at a time. I believe I answered that question in my video, but I'll briefly go over it again. Athletes will be free to use PEDs, unlike right now, where only some athletes can get away with it. Of course, there's a lot more nuance. People will make a counter-argument saying athletes, countries that invest the most money into doping will take the best PEDs, while poor athletes, countries, won't be able to take the best PEDs. I can't fully agree with this argument, because it assumes the best PEDs will be highly inaccessible and expensive without explaining why, and it fails to answer why the no anti-doping option is less fair. People have the belief that the efficacy of a drug is correlated with its price. Looking at current PEDs, 
this isn't the case. In fact, you can even argue it's the opposite. HGH is extremely expensive and hard to access, yet it's not a very powerful PVD. A whale if they're taking a moderate dose cycle of test and train would have an advantage over a whale if they're taking low dose HGH and test. And like I mentioned in my last video, there's a point of diminishing returns that's far lower for a whale if they're and track and field athlete compared to a high level bodybuilder. So an expensive cycle of 2 grams of anabolics with HGH would actually lower the performance of the athlete. So more money put into PEDs would actually reduce performance. Currently, an athlete can buy a 5 year supply of reasonable PEDs for the price of an illegal bear. People who couldn't afford them wouldn't even be able to buy sports equipment anyway. Also, since I'm for legalizing anabolics, like a lot of people are, you could argue the price of PEDs would go down. My argument is that almost everyone would still have access to PEDs, and this is true in the current reality. There are bodybuilders all around the world taking PEDs right now, despite the differences in legality. The funny thing is, I can think of an argument against my position, but then I could also think about an argument against the argument, but unfortunately this video would be way too long. And like I said, this is a very, very long discussion. Knowing then that that is what's going to be required to reach the elite levels in the sport, which teenager is going to join weightlifting? Whose parents are going to drive their kids to the gym knowing that essentially the conclusion to them being a talented athlete is that they're going to have to take an enormous amount of gear? Essentially a requirement to take drugs to compete would pressure athletes to take drugs when they don't want to. Again. This is describing the current situation. For a kid to compete at the highest level in the current reality, they'll eventually have to use drugs. I also think this is worsened by the propaganda from WADA. A lot of talented kids believe they can become an Olympic champion. They're fooled into believing that and only realize later on that the sport is pretty much full of drugs. Also, as we know, humans, through their differences in physiology and endocrinology, respond differently to exogenous hormones. People also metabolize and excrete hormones differently. You could argue in the current system that a person that lacks two copies of the UGT2B17 gene has good genetics because their genetics allows them to get away with taking more testosterone. It's really how you define good genetics. I would consider a person that responds better to PEDs as having great genetics. Drugs in some ways make this romantic idea about sports fade even more. The moment that there is a PED free for all, the more the training and genetic advantages that we're born with begin to sort of skew slightly more unfairly. I think competitive sports will become more and more about drug use regardless. Progression in science and technology without the intent to improve human performance will probably find its way into sports. Like this happened with anabolics where the main purpose of them was for breast cancer, muscle wasting diseases and other medical conditions. It's also happening with peptides and serums and eventually CRISPR. The point is that PEDs will be created without direct funding for PED research. It might happen at a faster rate with direct funding for PEDs, but eventually I think competitive sports will become more and more about technology rather than talent and hard work. But this is definitely a topic for another video. Clarence's second point is that it facilitates corruption. But there are other ways to be corrupt. Removing anti-doping wouldn't remove corruption from how people tend to act and respond in these kinds of situations. To my mind this is just wishful thinking. There are plenty of other ways in weightlifting through which money can be transferred and, and pass hands under the table. Just like paying an official to change someone's body weight when they go to compete. I do believe there are other ways corruption can manifest. Seb gave the example of an official being bribed to lie about someone's body weight, but why wouldn't countries take advantage of this right now? There's even an example of a weightlifter who was threatened to be assassinated. This happened in the current system, 
and it would happen without anti-doping. Countries take advantage of anti-doping because it's the easiest tool to use and manipulate who wins and who loses. If it was removed, I think it would get rid of the biggest driver of corruption in weightlifting because it's what countries take advantage of right now. Of course, you can argue that other forms of corruption would happen to a much greater degree if anti-doping didn't exist, but you'd need to elaborate on that and explain why that would be the case. If anti-doping worked 100% of the time, I would actually be all for it. I just don't think anti-doping should exist because of the problems it creates. Now the crux of this argument to me sounds like a false dichotomy. To be honest, I think my statement at the beginning wasn't even what I believe anyway, because my arguments in the video against anti-doping wasn't just about its efficacy. So I definitely made an error in my video and I shouldn't have put it like I did in the beginning. So this is fair criticism. I don't know what percentage of efficacy I would support anti-doping, because it's not the only thing that matters. I don't support anti-doping for multiple other reasons, like I explained in my video, such as the propaganda and dishonesty, how it's halting research into PEDs, how it targets people unequally, how it demonizes PEDs. It also depends on the history of anti-doping. I consider the past 50 years of anti-doping to be a failure. If the war on drugs suddenly became incredibly effective, I don't think people would say it was a good thing. There's also more reasons, so it's definitely not just about the efficacy. Do you really believe drug testing in every country in the world is equal? So I don't actually think that Clarence is wrong about this, but what about the problems that are created by not testing. In what is commonly referred to as Goldman's dilemma, Robert Goldman polled world-class athletes and he asked them, would you take a pill that would guarantee you a gold medal even if you knew that it would kill you in five years? And more than half of the athletes said that they would do it. So the population of athletes that we're talking about when we speak about anti-doping are an extremely intense-minded group of people. Their desire to win and do whatever it takes is just off the charts. Seb mentions Goldman's dilemma, but I think my previous criticism debunks that. Countries are able to, right now, under the current system, create the five-year debt compound. In fact, you could argue that it's more likely because of lack of regulation. Like, Balco could have created a compound that would have killed athletes in five years. The current drug testing at least places some kind of limit on how many or how much PEDs can be taken. But if we remove testing, more will be taken. And this is made clear by the fact that in weightlifting performance, other than for Lashitalikadze, performance is significantly lower now than it was in the 80s, where testing was even more lenient. He also mentions weightlifters in the 80s lifting more than current weightlifters. That is true for sure, but I don't think it's fair to say that was definitely because of less drug testing. It may be the case that weightlifters trained much harder back then, and the standard was way higher. And I would argue that was the case. Also, there are weightlifters right now who are never getting drug tested, so why aren't they beating lifters from the 80s? But to be fair, that's not even addressing his main argument. The testing that we do have at the very least provides a limit to the individual quantity taken. I can respond to that argument by saying athletes are using urine substitution and they're avoiding tests entirely, so there's no limit for those athletes. But I think what he meant to say was drug testing reduces the number of athletes using PEDs and it can reduce the amount of PEDs a person can take, or it stops more kids from using PEDs. I would agree with that. There's no data, of course, but I would still say that is most likely correct, that it does reduce the number of athletes and kids using PEDs in sport. However, an even better way to phrase that argument or ask that question is, does anti-doping existing reduce the overall harm done by PED use? The answer to that question, I don't know, but I'll give you reasons why it could be the case and that increases overall harm. So just because the amount of PEDs used 
is reduced, that doesn't mean overall harm is lowered. An analogy is that the Netherlands prioritizes harm reduction of street drugs, while Sweden has a strong emphasis on criminalization and has limited use of harm reduction. But the Netherlands has far fewer overdose deaths compared to Sweden, despite the Netherlands having a higher population. So if PEDs were legal and allowed in sports, it would allow athletes to easily get blood work, allow doctors to monitor their health and use safer anabolics with more research done on them. This is the point I made in my last video that anti-doping unintentionally forces athletes to use dangerous compounds if they want to win. Removing anti-doping could make more athletes use PEDs, but it may lower overall harm done. Again, I don't know the true answer to this question. No one does. There's a lot of data on the war on drugs and its problems, but there's pretty much none on this. A lot of people will say, you're just speculating, therefore you're wrong. But literally both sides of this debate require speculating because of the lack of hard evidence. The best we can do is speculate and make arguments based on logic and existing evidence. Seb and many others speculated that it increases overall harm, and I speculate that it can increase overall harm. We both gave our reasons and logic. Also, the question of does the existence of anti-doping reduce the overall harm done by PEDs completely ignores the harm from PED use outside of sports. The number of recreational PED users is far higher than the number of PED users in sports. So it doesn't matter that much if anti-doping existing reduces overall harm or if it increases overall harm. Right now, the amount of harm done by PED use outside of sports is much higher. So that's what we should care about most. We should come up with solutions to fix that problem too. It's also how you define harm. A woman might be fully aware of the virilization side effects of anabolics, but may choose to take them anyway. Her goal to become a big bodybuilder will make her happy despite the side effects. So would this really be causing more overall harm to her? Does she have a mental problem? Does someone wanting to achieve the highest level in sports have a mental problem? Again, <laughs> this is a long discussion. 3. It demonizes PEDs. Now quick preface to this section. I don't believe that PEDs should be illegal for the general public. I don't think that PEDs should be demonized at all for non-competing citizens. And it's for that reason I have no problem with Clarence choosing to take them or Sally from down the road choosing to take them. What if Sally down the road was a teenage girl into bodybuilding? Would you care about the harm she could do to herself by taking PEDs? Would you care about all the teenage bodybuilders that decide to take PEDs? Why is it that you would only care about athletes that are in sport and not outside of sport? Obviously, I think Seb would care about Sally down the road. I just don't think he has thought of that. And I think his arguments would be stronger if he was against legalizing PEDs. If someone isn't willing to sacrifice their health, they simply shouldn't participate. Now to my mind, there is a huge difference between sacrificing your own health through the side effects of competing in the sport, wearing your body and mind down through the extreme training is a cost that you just have to pay. But the cost to your body through PED use, to me, isn't something that you should have to pay. Athletes' bodies already suffer an enormous amount through the rigorous training they do. And that's good, that's how it should be. That's, that's commitment in sport. But saying that if you aren't willing to sacrifice your health beyond training through PEDs, then you shouldn't be trying to participate, just doesn't sit right with me. I made that statement for the current situation in sports with anti-doping. To get to the highest level in the current system, you will have to use drugs and sacrifice your health. Seb probably meant to say athletes would have to sacrifice their health even more if anti-doping didn't exist. I'm pretty sure I addressed that point in my earlier criticism, so I won't go over it again. Recreational bodybuilding isn't drug tested, yet there are many that decide not to take drugs because they don't want to suffer side effects. Now this example of bodybuilding does a disservice to the argument that Clarence is putting forward to me. Making those sports a free-for-all in terms of the amount of drugs that can be used hasn't changed the public perception 
of them. And if anything, the public perception of bodybuilding and strongman is worse because of the rampant drug use. If people want non-drug tested weightlifting, which they clearly do based on Clarence's videos, which is fine by the way, then the good thing is that it is possible to start your own federation. But I don't think that the reduction in demonising PEDs will be severe enough in the public opinion to grant the IOC this feeling that they can replace current weightlifting with free-for-all weightlifting. If bodybuilding works fine with a drug federation and a doping control federation, which like in weightlifting works a certain amount in that the bodybuilders who are tested aren't quite as big as the bodybuilders who aren't, then why should we remove anti-doping from weightlifting when we can follow in their footsteps and if people desire, just create a second federation that isn't drug tested? I truly don't understand Seb's argument here. I also don't see how it was a counter-argument to anti-doping demonizes PEDs. Maybe he wasn't trying to attack that argument, or maybe I'm just misunderstanding it. It'd be good if he could elaborate on that. I know that this is going to seem like an oversimplification, but it's almost as like as if we're saying that if we can't catch every shoplifter, and most people still have to pay full price for the products, then we should just allow everybody to shoplift. A lot of people have made a similar argument, such as, Clarence, if we followed your logic, we should get rid of police because we can't catch every crime. In my opinion, it's a bad analogy because it can also support my position. Let's say we have criminal activity X. Should we police it? My answer is yes if it's effective. My answer is no if it's ineffective and creates more problems. So there are three parts. One, is the criminal activity or activity unethical? And two, is having a policy in place to stop it effective or ineffective? And three, does the policy create more problems? So you can use that same line of thinking to make an analogy that supports my position. We can't catch everyone that uses street drugs, therefore we should stop the war on drugs. It's a bad premise, but the conclusion a lot of people would agree is correct. So going over those three parts with anti-doping, so number one, is using PEDs bad? Number two, is anti-doping effective? And number three, does anti-doping create more problems? People just asserted my argument was that simple, which it was not. I addressed those three points in my last video. Four, it forces athletes to use dangerous compounds. Oral trembolone is one of the most dangerous steroids ever created. The only reason athletes used it was because of anti-doping. They probably wouldn't use it otherwise. Now this is actually a really good point, but I think the most obvious rebuttal to me is that Clarence is making the assumption that with no anti-doping, every athlete will get access to the best possible PEDs. So I think Seb made an error and meant to say safest instead of best. But let's take those two arguments. Clarence is making the assumption that with no anti-doping, every athlete will get access to the safest possible PEDs. So my short argument against that is right now, every athlete doesn't have access to the safest possible PEDs. And it's worse because they're restricted on what they can use, which ends up being more dangerous compounds. In other words, the current reality is worse, even if in the no anti-doping reality, every athlete couldn't get access to the safest compounds. If he did mean best, then that doesn't attack my argument, but I addressed that argument earlier anyway. But that won't happen. I mean, in some countries, the drugs themselves will still be illegal domestically and thus won't be readily available. But that fact is true right now. His arguments would only work if athletes didn't use drugs right now. Also, this reminds me of a, a bad argument I made in my video. I didn't distinguish between anti-doping and the legal status of PEDs. I implied those two things existed together rather than separately. If there wasn't such a negative stigma about drug use and anti-doping just didn't exist in sports, the laws would actually be different around the world. So I'm against anti-doping and I'm for legalizing PEDs, 
Does that change some arguments? Maybe. Other substances will be treated like closely guarded secrets for the countries that do use them. That happened under the current system, Balco being the example, and it's most likely happening right now. I went over that with my previous criticism. Athletes who live in countries with better funding will do better. Again, both sides of this debate create an unlevel playing field. I don't think Clarence is fair in his idea that removing testing will make this sport fair. My feeling is that it will make things even less fair. I never said it would make sports fair, but I argued that it would make it more fair. Seb argued that it would make it even less fair. To be honest, I think Seb just repeated his first argument differently and didn't address my argument, which was anti-doping forces athletes to use more dangerous PEDs. Maybe he meant to argue no anti-doping forces athletes to use PEDs that are more dangerous compared to anti-doping existed. If he or someone has more points supporting that argument, it'd be interesting to hear. In my opinion, it's quite similar to the anti-doping reduces overall harm argument, which I already addressed. I think another assertion made here that doesn't quite sit right with me is this idea that athletes from clean countries simply cannot compete under the current system. Given that there is a world champion from the USA and that there are an increasing number of international medalists from countries with strong anti-doping systems, it seems clear that the current system is enabling clean athletes to compete and even win sometimes even if the system clearly isn't perfect and it does skew heavily against them. This may have been a misunderstanding, or I didn't say things correctly in my first video, but I don't believe that. Of course athletes can compete clean in the current system and be successful. I would rephrase my argument to talented athletes can't compete against athletes that are equally talented and on gear. He mentions Kate Nye and other athletes, most likely clean, being successful. Now most people would make the argument that they may in fact be on PEDs right now, which is a fair argument, but to make it short, I actually believe most American, German, Spanish, British weightlifters, etc. are clean because of anti-doping, culture and their personalities. I guess over the years I've developed steroid x-ray eyes and I can determine who's clean. Whatever, I could talk about this for ages and make more points. Well, I agree with Zach's opinions and Seb's opinions. I would say Kendrick Farris was most likely clean, and I would say Kate and I is most likely clean. But there are many points I could say about this, which I'll summarize, because I believe Seb would agree anyway. Also, I'm not discrediting anyone's achievements. In fact, I think Americans would win more medals in weightlifting if drug testing worked 100% of the time. So, number one, Kate and I was a world champion in a non-Olympic weight class, which is less competitive. Two, drug use in women's weightlifting is most likely far lower compared to men's weightlifting due to more women wanting to avoid worse side effects from PED use. Number three, clean lifters competed at a high level in sport, but not the highest level. I don't think any clean lifter or clean track and field athlete has broken a world record. And number four, drug testing has advanced to the point where clean athletes can be more successful. Now this last point is perhaps the most important point with regards to Clarence's point that athletes are forced to take drugs that are dangerous because of anti-doping protocols. So a substance that is both safe and available to everybody would actually be legal under the current anti-doping rules. For a substance to be banned, it has to meet two of the following three criteria. One, that it's dangerous. Two, that it provides an advantage. And three, that it's unfair in terms of its difficulty to purchase or get hold of. Seb's last criteria of it's unfair in terms of its difficulty to purchase doesn't match the last criteria that was put in his video, which states it violates the spirit of sport. Nowhere online could I find the last criteria he mentioned, but let's just accept it as true for the sake of argument. First, I don't think this is a counter-argument against my argument of athletes are forced to use more dangerous compounds, because athletes are using drugs right now. WADA's criteria doesn't stop 
state-sponsored doping. I don't understand how WADA's criteria can stop athletes taking dangerous drugs right now. I don't know, maybe I'm just misrepresenting his argument, or he didn't explain it correctly. So safe drugs, as Clarence pointed out, aren't something that can only be taken in a world without drug testing. If the drugs truly are safe, and then we make them readily available and easy for anyone to get hold of, then they would be legal substances. I never said in a world without anti-doping that athletes can use safe drugs. I said athletes would at least have the option to use safer drugs compared to what is necessary now to win at least. And I still don't understand how that's an argument against my position. It's like his argument assumes people are not breaking the rules right now. I could make an argument against his WADA criteria point, but I don't think his point is attacking my argument. It'd be great if Seb could elaborate on this argument, because maybe I'm missing something. So that was near the end of Seb's video. At the end, he just gave a conclusion. I think that ultimately, Clarence sees that drug testing makes things unfair. And I agree with him that the current version of drug testing, where people look the other way and money exchanges hands, goes under the table, it is unfair. But I just also think that no drug testing would also be even more unfair. It seems Seb forgot to include my last argument. My last point was about the WADA propaganda and dishonesty. And that's another reason why I think anti-doping is unethical. A point I haven't seen someone make is that maybe I painted anti-doping in a bad light in my video highlighting all the corruption and failed drug tests. But a positive way to look at that information is that it was uncovered because of the efforts of anti-doping and that's showing it's working rather than not working. It's not completely impossible that anti-doping could stop a lot more corruption and catch a lot more people using PEDs. Could it stop it completely? No, but its efficacy can increase dramatically. It's easy to look at my video and get blown away about all the failures of anti-doping and then agree with my position without questioning my arguments. I got a lot of comments in favor of my position while they made bad arguments. Those people really just need to think about this more and realize just how complex this debate can be. Like Seb said, Please do let me know what you think, not what Clarence thinks or what I think down below in the comment section. What you think about this whole topic. But yeah, that was Seb's video. I commend him for making arguments against my position. If he wants to elaborate further on some of his arguments, that would be great. Maybe I misinterpreted some of his points or he didn't explain them like he wanted. But yeah, go check out Seb's channel. He's the only weightlifting news channel on YouTube and he's certainly doing a great job. So I searched online for more arguments and I just wanted to see what people were talking about after I posted my video. And a lot of people were saying how I should have provided a solution, which is a fair point, I guess. Um, like one person said, criticizing a system without comparing it to the next best alternative isn't fair criticism. It ignores the benefits even a flawed system provides. But I think it's useful to point out the flaws of a system, even if a solution isn't provided. At least that would help people in the future to come up with a solution. I would say criticizing the war on drugs without giving a solution is still an interesting debate to have. Saying it was a mistake and should have never happened is a useful discussion to have. My video was a series of what ifs, answering the question of what if drug testing didn't exist in the first place and how things probably would have been different. In my video, I never stated that drug testing should be removed from the Olympics right now because I believe that is almost impossible. But there are things that are possible right now that can be encouraged. So I'm just going to list these points, but I won't be elaborating on them because it can be a video itself. So number one, anti-doping programs and the public should stop demonizing PEDs. Number two, anti-doping and the public should be more honest about PED use in sports and explain the realities of it so people can make informed decisions. Number three, 
people and parents in particular should discourage children from high level sports. Number four, as a society, we should stop glorifying high level sport. Number five, create an untested federation for sports. Number six, harm reduction strategies should be implemented for PED users. Number seven, untested federations should discourage use of dangerous PEDs. There are probably more points I can make, but like I said, this is a whole other video on its own. So, um, <laughs> this ended up being a very long video, and like I said, it's a huge discussion. A problem I believe is that people didn't ask the right questions or make the correct arguments when I posted the video, and I'm definitely guilty of this. I'm also learning that it's important to correctly word your arguments. I made errors in my video which don't actually represent how I feel, so I hope I did a better job in this video. Ultimately, I think this debate comes down to these questions. So number one, does the existence of anti-doping reduce the overall harm done by PED use? Number two, the countries that invest the most money into doping will have an advantage. With that in mind, what would be more fair? A world with anti-doping or a world without anti-doping? Number three, corruption exists in a world with anti-doping and without anti-doping. In what world would there be less corruption? So maybe there's some problems with those questions. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. But I think those questions are a good place to start the debate. So let me know what you think about my arguments. Do you agree or disagree? Are they flawed? It'll definitely be interesting to read the comments.